Hello everyone, and welcome to The Legend Makers. With me today is special guest Phil, and I'm your host, her brother. Over the course of these episodes, we are going to explore some popular stories that we love, and dive a bit more deeply into the way that these stories act as guides and tools for understanding the world around us. We're going to be drawing on a combination of philosophy, science, and religious thought to better explore these ideas. But at the end of the day, we don't mean this to be an educational podcast. It's just for asking questions, starting interesting conversations, and having fun. Oh, you think darkness is your ally? You merely adopted the dark. I was born in it, molded by it. I didn't see the light until I was already a <laughs> man. Um, okay, so that was a solid Kermit the Frog. <laughs> Hello, I, everyone. I Welcome to a very special episode. So today, the Dark Knight. This is your passion project. I think I've yeah, been yeah. listening to you talk about how how much of a masterpiece this movie is for what the past. Okay. Five years. I've, to six be, to years. To be fair, I've only pushed that it's a masterpiece because our mom is insistent that it's terrible. This is true. This is true. It's. I don't think it's the greatest movie I ever made by any stretch, but I do think that it's commonly misunderstood as either being, oh, we live in a society. Yeah, true. Or it's to the other extreme of, oh, it's just like, is it masochism or sadism? Sadism? I think so. I think it's sadism. Yeah, sad- masochism is personal. Okay, yeah, yeah. You like hurting yourself. Sadism is got hurting it. others. Yes, <laughs> yeah, well, people people will say, oh, it's too dark or too edgy or, or whatever. Gratuitous. It's, in my opinion, and as we're going to talk about, it's a very interesting, well thought out, and quite hopeful story, despite mm-hmm. its really dark exterior. And... No, I mean, I totally agree with you. I just, I think it's hilarious <laughs> how many times you've talked about this and it just evolves every time. Every few years, yeah, it... you have a moment where you just have to completely start from scratch and rehash how much you love this film. I just go deeper and deeper every and yeah, time. Yeah, every time. It's like, we have to go deeper. I mean, everyone, I think, knows who Batman is. But for people who haven't seen the movies, May basically, I? go ahead. Yeah, you go ahead. Billionaire, opera, dead parents, bats. I mean, that's a pretty good summary. We're going to be focusing on the middle movie in the Christopher Nolan trilogy. Yes. So it's The Dark Knight. That's just the title, flat. I'll be talking about Batman and Begin- Batman Begins and The Dark Knight Rises later on a little bit, just to complete the story arc, so to speak. But we're really yeah. just going to be fo- focusing on the plot of The Dark Knight, because that's what matters. It's also, The Dark Knight is also the most pivotal in the story that kind of ties through all three. Um, And it's my favorite of the three movies too. So just in terms of the premise of The Dark Knight, where Mm -hmm. it starts, it basically, he's become Batman. Batman is a vigilante, dresses like a bat, fights crime at night, Mm -hmm. scourge of the underworld, Mm -hmm. greatest detective in the world. No guns. Classic stuff. Yeah, he doesn't use guns. And... Although he seems not against using giant machine guns and cannons on his vehicles. So I'm not really sure where he you sits know. on that in this universe, but that's okay. So in this movie... But he never directs those machine guns towards people. He uses it to blow up buildings. That's there's true. a line. Yes, he has is... a philosophy. No, no, no. Okay, we're going to get into that. Okay, for now, all you need to know, at the beginning of the movie, the Dark Knight kind of takes place after... Bruce Wayne, Mm -hmm. billionaire man, has already become Batman and he's fully been operating in Gotham as Batman for a little while now. Yes. Maybe we could talk about our favorite characters or... Yeah, let's re-familiarize ourselves with the story. So the Christopher Nolan... Batman as a comic book character has been around forever, but we're focusing on the Christopher Nolan adaptations for many reasons, most predominantly of which are the philosophical and thought-provoking ones, but also just because they're the most grounded and coherent Batman adaptations film-wise. Yeah, and I mean, we grew up with them. And we grew up with them. I think they came out in the the particular time period that we were young enough to appreciate them and also old enough to appreciate them. <laughs> I, I saw it. I, I had absolutely it. no idea what was going on pretty much for the entirety of that movie. No, yeah, and then I saw it again when I was in middle school, and I, I did really like it. We watched it on like one of our Christmas 
You know when you're in middle school and when the Christmas holidays are yeah, happening, yeah. they you have like the afternoon off before the last day of break and you have a movie day with pizza yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. So we watched The Dark Knight, <laughs> a room full of 12-year-olds in a dimmed classroom in mid-December. And that time, I, it kind of clicked that, oh, this is a good movie actually. Yeah, I think it's definitely a movie that needs rewatches just because it's so much happens. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, I didn't watch it till probably I was 12, maybe. I don't know. We, yeah. we bought this weird special edition of the disc from, I think, Sears Outlet. Oh my it was god, going we out of did! Business. Yeah. And that's when I first saw it. It's because we bought the disc and I, I was the one who asked to buy the disc because I'd never seen the movie. And I don't think we owned it. And that's when I first saw it. But well, and then we'd it's... seen we'd seen Batman Begins many Yeah, times. we did love Batman Begins. That that I maintain that's a very solid movie. Yeah, I mean it's a lot more kid friendly. Yes. Um, except for the terrifying scarecrow nightmare scenes. Oh yeah. <laughs> we, we do love those. We just closed our eyes for that. So I guess for me, I didn't really get invested into the Dark Knight in particular, probably until high school when I saw it again. And I was kind of old enough to understand what was happening. Mm -hmm. um, and I think since then I've rewatched it many times. And every time it's just as good as the last time. So I think I've only actually rewatched it maybe once or twice. I haven't seen it in a really long time until we sat and rewatched it particularly for this episode. Yeah. And so a lot of its beats surprised me because I think it was a lot darker in my memory than it actually is in practice in real life and i think interestingly enough that's kind of true of a lot of christopher nolan's work i think i the older i've gotten the more surprised i am at the reputation he has for making kind of gridmark dark movies because yeah. all of his movies are very fundamentally hopeful and about you know the love and the human spirit and well, justice. I mean, to be and... fair, we haven't seen all of his movies. Well, many of them. The, I mean, the Prestige is pretty dark. Okay, Prestige is pretty dark. But I'm I'm thinking, you know, Interstellar, the... Interstellar, Inception, Inception the, the Dark, dark Knight movie. trilogy. They have a very hopeful outlook on human nature and human relationships and the endurance of yeah. the human spirit. And so I, I'd always, when I was younger, I think dismissed some of Chris Nolan's work because. I guess I just bought into the popular notion that, you know, this is a man director who makes grid mark man movies that, that are sad and mad and we live in a society. And the funny thing is, is that on the other extreme, you had people who over kind of worshipped his stuff because of those reasons. Yes. And both accounts, I think, are wrong because having rewatched Chris Nolan's movies as an adult, um, who very much values themes of like subtle human relationship and yeah. love and hope. I really, really appreciate the kinds of stories that he tells. And so all of this to say, upon rewatching The Dark Knight, I was very pleasantly surprised at the kind of message it carries and the kinds of points that it pushes through. Um, I am glad. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I've won you over. <laughs> my, my brother feels vindication. <laughs> uh, I love most characters that show up. There might be a couple relatively uninteresting ones. For me, I interpret many of the characters in, as we'll talk about yes. in the Dark Knight movies, as being more representative of ideas and operating within the narrative to contrast one another, as opposed to being fully fleshed out people. Like human beings, yeah. They don't really have a lot of clear motivations a lot of times. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, this guy's a mobster, mm -hmm. right? And he represents this. Or... Well, they're very archetypal. Exactly. And I really like that kind of mm -hmm. storytelling. And I think mm -hmm. it fits really well with the style of the movies and what they do. But in particular, I mean, we both love Alfred. Yes, I think as much as Bruce is the main character, I would have to say that my favorite character is Alfred, partially because Michael Caine gives a stunning performance, but also because I think in many ways, Alfred is the emotional core of the trilogy. Yeah. And so the the scene in the third one where he's at the grave yeah, and, and, and he starts crying, Yeah. that, I mean, I think... As flawed as the third movie is, that particular moment always makes me cry. Yeah. When I was a little kid, it made me cry. And as an adult, it makes me cry. And I think it's because, again, Bruce's journey is very much grounded in Alfred as a presence and Alfred as somebody mm -hmm. looking out for him and reminding yeah. him of who he is mm -hmm. and challenging him at every turn. I think a lot of the other characters challenge him in an 
abstract or philosophical sense, mm -hmm. but Alfred challenges him on a very personal level. Well, Alfred is sort of his anchor to the world between mm -hmm. all of his different identities and directions mm -hmm, that he's being mm -hmm. pulled in, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why he's, I think, he, like you said, the emotional core. Yeah. I guess for me, I would probably say Alfred too, but to be different, <laughs> I I really like I know you really like him too. I yeah. really like uh, Liam Neeson's portrayal oh, yeah. of Ra's al Ghul just because it's Liam Neeson, and yeah. I also really like what's his name Jim Gordon. Oh, Gary, uh, uh, Gary, Oldman. Gary Oldman, legend. Yeah, yeah. I, I really like his portrayal of the character too. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of favorite character, I do really like Bruce, and I really like Christian Bale's portrayal. Yeah, I think but... of all the versions of Batman I've seen, Christian Bale's Batman. While not, as we said, the most humanly full dimensional because it's yeah. an archetypal character, I do really like the way he portrays Batman and the levity that he brings to the character who is, you know, constantly in very serious situations. Mm -hmm. I mean, he also just looks really good. <laughs> I have to be honest there. Uh, he does not look as good as he did in Reign of Fire. But... That's a conversation for another time. <laughs> you know, the beard, the horse, okay. the 12 children. <laughs> Get back on track here. I was going to say my favorite character is probably the Joker. And we'll talk about why pretty soon. Okay. Purely because of how great he is as a storytelling device. This is like you saying your favorite character was Gollum for Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is going to be a recurring theme. I promise I'm not an edgy 12-year-old. So favorite scene. Go ahead. Boat scene from The Dark Knight. I mean, we just watched it, and that's the best scene in the whole trilogy. That's the the, yeah, the fulc thematic fulcrum moment of the whole trilogy. I agree. I'll say favorite scene is the one right after that where he confronts Dent at the end. True. I love that scene. I will definitely not be rereading it in its entirety later on to prove a point. Word for word from the script found online. Stay tuned for that. Wait, we should just rate the whole trilogy here. I think that's a lot easier. So, I think it's pretty memeable. It's one of those weird things that is not hugely memeable because it's so serious, but it, it it's, had plenty it, of memes. It also, in its I time. think, it did have plenty of memes in its day. I mean, the classic Batman uh, going around aggressively asking people questions, like like the "Where's the, Rachel? Where's Rachel? Where are you hiding them? Yeah, or, where are the drugs? Or like, etc." The regular "I'm Batman." Yeah. And the, Dark voice. Um, um, I mean, I, I always found it funny that in uh, Dark Knight Rises... Okay, so Dark Knight Rises, all of Bane's lines were big memes. Yeah. Uh, shout out to Tom Hardy. Excellent performance there. I also appreciated the callback to the Adam West show with Bruce flying the bomb out over the water in Dark Knight Rises. Mm. I mean, generally speaking, I think Dark Knight Rises is the most memeable, memeable film. There, um, are, there are a lot of Bane memes... There, are, I don't think there are too many memes from Batman Begins. Maybe there were, but we were too young to remember. Um, yeah. But I mean, Joker, plenty of like the Joker yes. meme is, has been repeated again and again because of the newer movies. Yes, but, talk about beating a dead horse. Yeah, I don't is even know if that's poor taste? so much of a meme, or it is just kind of a weird obsession because <laughs> it's. It's half ironic, half serious, and you can yeah. never really tell with people. But we have to include it Gen there. Generally, in my mind, Heath Ledger's version of the Joker is completely divorced from any other iteration of the Joker yeah. that is out there. I think, for me, when I think about the Jared Leto Joker memes, <laughs> they do not even register. They don't even ping on the same dimension <laughs> as Heath Ledger's performance as the Joker. I mean, we also haven't seen the the newest Joker movie. I've heard it's good, but we should watch oh, it Oh, right. Soon. I completely yeah. forgot that existed. Yeah, that kind of re revitalized a lot. Yes, that's true. Uh, okay, how about for memeability overall? I would say a solid 7, because you can't deny that the, the Dark Knight trilogy, Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy, has had a major cultural impact. Oh, yeah, undeniably. Um, I think it's probably the most grounded and sophisticated and planned out adaptation of batman on the big screen that has ever existed yeah I, yeah I mean, I mean something like batman and robin is iconic but not even on the same <laughs> playing field <laughs> yeah you can't really judge them side by side um, and the new dc stuff is kind of all over the place in I, terms of soundtrack next, okay next anything anything that manifests out of Hans zimmer's big brain is 
automatically perfect. No, no argument. No, here. no comparison. Yeah, um, absolutely iconic soundtrack, and I think the aesthetic is great. I think it presents a very believable real world while still maintaining mm-hmm. kind of a fun comic-y element to, to certain parts of it. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about this when we watched Dark Knight, and I ha- I was really appreciating the way that these movies make an objectively absurd and kind of unexplained universe feel very tied into the real world, even though they never actually articulate which part of the real world it exists within. And I think part of that is in the script writing um, and the dialogue. I think one of the things that I mentioned to you that I really appreciate is Chris Nolan's writing utilizes something that you often see in short story, Mm -hmm. or at least in my experience, I'm no expert, but in my experience in short story format, a character with not a lot of, uh, what's the word for it, expository backstory will have a conversation with another character that kind of very seamlessly ties in references to a world outside their immediate surroundings that is vague enough that it doesn't have to it doesn't need exposition but particular enough that it makes you think of something that you're already familiar with right Mm -hmm. like alfred's conversation with bruce about that time they were in what is it burma Burma, Burma. and they encountered that guy who'd been stealing the bandit the bandit who had been burning whatever stealing the jewels and then they had to burn the forest down to find him and he'd been giving them to little kids right yeah now you have no context for what alfred was doing in burma you have no context for where gotham is in relation to burma you have no well it's in america it's in vague america right but your your understanding of the the direct and intricate ties of that yeah. conversation to the rest of the world that they exist within is very murky but the simplicity and yet the precision of alfred's dialogue in that yeah. scene makes you automatically completely have this very vivid picture of who he must have been when he was younger where he was how that ties into the Mm -hmm. thematic elements of the story here. So I I realize I kind of went on a tangent, but related to aesthetic and the way that the world is constructed, I think that these movies are excellent. All of Christopher Nolan's movies, I really appreciate those elements. A lot of character origins are unexplained, but it never really bothers you. Mm -hmm. At least in my experience. Maybe other people are bothered. For for me, many of the characters... It doesn't feel necessary a lot of times because Mm -hmm. what you need is presented to you Mm -hmm. and the little kind of hints give you a strong Mm -hmm. sense of what the character's background must be like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think of the three movies... Dark Knight Rises is probably the weakest and most weirdly expositionary of the three. Batman Begins and The Dark Knight itself are quite well done. The other thing in terms of aesthetic, I mentioned this when we were watching last time. This is a totally personal thing. I love the use of geometric shapes in Chris Nolan's movies. I think that they, they just give the space such an interesting and sharp, clear What do you mean exactly? So... The, I mean, you see, you kind of see this in Inception as well, or in Interstellar, right? But he he'll use a lot of, and this is the artist's brain in me, but he'll use a lot of rectangles or squares or circle or, and you in know, terms of fr- framing his shots, and then the but also the literal objects yeah. and spaces, right? You have framing of shots that you know many directors use shape and angle in the very visual literal sense the environments are very geometric and they're just so aesthetically pleasing. Mm -hmm. I love it. I mean, I... I, I, It is just nice to look at. It is simply nice to look at and I think it really makes up for the lack of color or vibrancy Mm -hmm. um, because the the use of shape is just really sexy. Yeah. (laughs) Um, In terms of set design, I know a lot of people are attached to older, goofy-looking Batmobiles where it's more kind of based on the comics. The, the kind of tank look to the Batmobile, I think is great. Yeah, I, I love, like his I suit. It. I think at times his suit can look goofy, but when he's mostly in the dark, it's not bad. Yeah, I um, love that shot in Dark Knight where he comes to put the mask on and there's no yeah. eye makeup around his eyes and you put, see him put the mask on and then the, the camera cuts and it turns and you see that somebody <laughs> yeah. has put on dark eyeliner around his eye sockets. 
yeah i think overall the movie does a good job at getting the heroes and villains and the gadgets and everything to still feel like it could exist in the real world great example dark knight rises I don't really think you could have made Bane like the Batman and Robin version of Bane where he's oh like God. a like an inflatable man. <laughs> balloon man <laughs> with the Mark Wahlberg balloon arms. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, so I, I, mean, I think I think with how they, the compromises that they have work really yes. well. Yes. The Joker's costuming feels really authentic yeah. and grounded where it very easily it could feel completely absurd. And possibly the weirdest stuff is the League of Shadows stuff. And even then, you kind of don't think about That's it. That's mostly just because of how unexplained it is. Yes. Yeah. In general, costuming, set design, all excellent. This movie gets a 10 out of 10 on wigs simply because I cannot tell if anyone is wearing a wig. So automatic win. Yeah. I guess, and then for aesthetic and soundtrack, aesthetic, let's say 9, soundtrack, let's say 10. So we'll average it to 9.5. Bro, so how can you give that soundtrack a 10? Soundtrack is 11 at the very least. I know, I'm trying it's to be... It's so iconic. I'm trying not to be biased here. The whole point of this exercise is to be com as completely flagrantly biased as we can be. Okay, fair. Okay, we'll give it a 10 for aesthetic and soundtrack. I just thought some people might complain about the color. It's a bit dark, but I like that personally. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a time... You know me. I love color. If I don't have color in my daily life, I wilt like a sad little flower. But I think that in certain films, there is time and place for use of color. And like I said, I think these movies use shape and angle to their great advantage. Mm -hmm. um, and also color, I think, again, something like The Dark Knight, the Joker as the most colorful item in the plane, in a scene, in yeah. a scene is great for shock value um i think it works well it's cleverly done high quality all around high quality enduringly enjoyable yeah okay so the actual theme of what we're going to be talking about here i'm going to just present it as a question because i think this is fundamentally a lot of this is going to be my interpretation of the film i don't know what nolan's intentions are yeah i know that generally speaking he doesn't like to say what he means with his movies he likes people to interpret for themselves and so Which this is, is really valid this is how i decide to interpret the movie um and i think it fundamentally asks a question and then answers it through the story and the different characters and the fundamental question i see it as being how do we contend with the chaos and injustice that seems to rule the world around us and i think the way he answers that is very thorough pretty he, he does a pretty thorough job actually a lot of this is going to be broken down by the way the movie breaks it down mm -hmm. and i'm gonna use a similar structure again indirectly but at first you have a lot of different characters but you can kind of uh, reduce it to a few categories so the, the main ones i think are bruce or batman harvey dent and the joker and then you also have jim gordon mm -hmm. on the side along with Pretty much everyone else, all the other major characters. A category and you like to call the schemers. It's what the Joker calls them yes. in the movie. And essentially, the way that the schemers, according to the Joker, and I think supported by the story itself, yes. the way that the schemers deal with this question is they, in fact, are kind of part of the problem. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who cover up the injustice or they try and construct narratives around why it's justified. Mm -hmm. They try and use that status quo to bolster themselves and control others mm -hmm. and kind of normalize a very passive and uncompassionate world mm -hmm. for ordinary people to live in. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Joker calls this the plan. The, yeah, in quotation marks. In quotation marks, very sarcastically. Yeah. But, and I, I think that's... He provides a very uh, reasonable argument, in fact, which is something I really like about this version of the Joker. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'll explain what he said. So the Joker sees the plan of the world, so to speak. Like it's the way that things work, the system. Yeah, exactly. As we being, live in a society. Yeah, <laughs> as being very hollow. And he, in particular, he takes it upon himself to be a really active agent for chaos in the world mm -hmm. because he thinks that the universe is ruled by chaos and he needs to be a reminder to everyone that all of their attempts to control humanity and society are all in vain 
people are fundamentally lawless and there's always conflict hidden beneath the surface and all you need to know or all you need to do is just push people a little bit before they show their true colors and turn against each other and act as animals and uh he thinks that an individual is absolutely powerless in the face of this kind of chaos and anarchy and he opposes batman in particular with respect to this issue uh he hates how people have idolized and propped up batman as a symbol of hope against injustice and in the movie after batman has been operating for a while the joker appears directly as a result of that he mm -hmm. appears to challenge batman yes kind um, of out of the ether nobody exactly, really knows exactly. where he came from <laughs> yeah and batman is essentially clear and understandable he isn't mm -hmm. super complex mm -hmm. he is what the joker has come to tear down mm -hmm. he isn't the system he doesn't believe in the institutions of the world and their justness but he believes in people mm -hmm. he believes in their inherent nobility and their ability to do good mm -hmm. and to be good and particularly he believes that no matter how bad society is mm -hmm. people deserve a chance at redemption yeah, individuals they deserve yes. to be saved and mm -hmm. he's the one who goes out and saves them so to speak can, and, can we elaborate on what you mean by saved because i think that that's a word that can have so he, both he, positive by, and negative by, connotations. by saved he means uh to give them a chance essentially mm -hmm. so that they aren't harmed by or they aren't kept down by the oppressiveness of the of system the, the system around right them. so in in the story it takes the shape of crime mm -hmm. in the metaphor where criminals cause harm to the city they create drug addicts they create mm -hmm. systems of dependency and corruption and mm -hmm. this and that ordinary people are affected poorly they can't live their lives mm -hmm. to the fullest and grow and i mean his own parents were murdered by a criminal but mm -hmm. in this movie that doesn't really take a primary mm -hmm. position in this movie his focus is more on sort of saving the soul of the city mm -hmm. he doesn't want the people to lose hope and mm -hmm. faith that if they improve and they do good mm -hmm. then the world will reciprocate mm -hmm. that well what's interesting is that i mean you brought up the fact that in the first movie a criminal what's this guy joe fresh or something there we go <laughs> close enough that guy killed his parents but then bruce kind of realizes that he is also beholden to the whims of the more intricate um system of criminality and corruption yeah, exactly. in the in the underbelly of the city but what i find interesting is by the time the dark knight rolls around the boat scene which we mm. both cited as our favorite scene it, it's no longer and the movies are a bit inconsistent on this this metaphor be, just purely because batman is there to fight crime yeah but the there's one boat with criminals you know career convicts and there's another boat with quote-unquote ordinary average people and the the point that that scene makes that furthers bruce's philosophy in this particular story is that both of those groups are deserving of the chance and he in fact is fully convinced of their capacity to kind of save themselves right to to rise above their their impulse of fear and yeah. chaos and to do the more difficult but more noble thing of risking their own harm in order not to harm others exactly so bruce doesn't necessarily believe that everyone is moral or mm -hmm. good but he believes that they're worthy mm -hmm. and th that's a part of why he doesn't kill people uh and uh, he doesn't he refuses to kill the joker that's a mm -hmm. big plot point that we can come back to he essentially wants people to be able to take a moral stand against injustice in their own lives mm -hmm. that's really and we'll, we'll come back to this because uh his philosophy i think can be connected externally to ideas of stoicism and idealism mm -hmm. and it, it it's not very particular in mm -hmm. what christopher nolan's trying to reflect mm -hmm. uh but it does connect to a lot of different mm -hmm. ideas that we'll, we'll talk about lastly harvey dent he's very much a foil for batman in this movie he isn't meant to be a very complex character again but he is very important he's kind of the linchpin of the whole story of the movie mm -hmm. he's the district attorney who's who's fighting against the mob in the movie and he's kind of seen as the white knight of gotham he's mm -hmm. on tvs he makes speeches mm -hmm. 
uh, people believe in him. That's the mm-hmm. slogan. Believe I believe in Harvey Dent. I believe in Harvey Dent. And he fights crime and corruption through the system, mm-hmm. right? So where Batman isn't necessarily against the system, he does work with pockets like yes. Jim Gordon. Uh, he isn't a part of the system. No. And he doesn't trust the system either. Yeah. Harvey Dent is a face on the system. Yes. And at first the Joker sees him as a schemer until later down the line. And, and we'll get to that. So the the brand of justice that Dent believes in is very materialistic. Yes. And this is shown, and we'll explain what I mean by that, through the story and how the Joker is eventually able to corrupt Dent's ideals. Mm-hmm. So the Dent, Dent starts as being very idealistic, but... At the end of the day, he's a lot more concerned with ends rather than means. He doesn't have the same principled belief system that Batman has. Mm-hmm. And when he personally begins to face chaos and anarchy and injustice of the world, mm-hmm. he his pragmatic stance on justice begins to fall apart very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I would say that if we're... Speaking philosophically, Dent's position on justice is not necessarily a pragmatic one, but rather it's very reified in the sense that he has this concept of justice that is not wholly examined. It's very beholden to institutions of crime and punishment and a betterment of a system to, you know, reduce crime, for example, as you said, more concerned with means, with ends than means. But when I say reified, he sees justice as what happens to individual people in the moment. And the kind of like ratio of good versus like very immediate, obvious good versus bad, Mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I, for example, lose my job and Joe Blow over there or Joe Joe Fresh (laughs) still has his job and he's not a nice guy and I'm a nice guy. That's unjust, you know, that's not fair. Mm -hmm. This whole thing with the coin. Exactly. We're going to talk about this, that Dent is, his version of justice revolves a lot more around fairness Mm -hmm. as opposed to it being a principled sense of justice. Mm -hmm. And the problem with fairness is that as the Joker successfully proves, the world isn't fair. Yes. And when Dent realizes that, that's when the Joker is able to corrupt him. Mm-hmm. And that's the Joker's goal from the very beginning. Yes. His goal is to tear down this face of goodness in society, which mm-hmm. is Harvey Dent. Um, and in particular, he does that by killing Dent's fiance Rachel, mm-hmm. who is also the love of Batman's life, even though we don't need to get into that. Yeah. Essentially, the, the only point here is that both Dent and Bruce are in love with Rachel, and when she dies, they both react very differently. Yes. Dent loses faith in everything, yeah. whereas Batman stays true and, in fact, holds his position even more strongly. Yes. And, and a large part of that is because of uh, Alfred's pep talk. Wholesome man. In terms of, I guess the last part is Jim Gordon. He's not really a critical part of the story, but I do think that he's important to mention because... Well, Jim is the more pragmatic, because you mentioned pragmatism. Yeah, he's, Jim he's is the kind more of the, guy. the everyman who's been thrust in this situation where he is sort of the litmus test for how successful Batman is mm-hmm. with his goal of inspiring mm-hmm. people, right? Jim Gordon operates in the system and mm-hmm. he's beholden to it, mm-hmm. but... Um, what he really needs a lot of times is the inspiration that he gets from Batman mm-hmm. because he he too can feel hopeless and yes. he's sort of the audience proxy, proxy in that yes. regard. Well, because he has a family to take care of. He has to be practical. You know, he knows that yeah. the system is corrupt, but he he's not necessarily in a position of power that he can change things through the system. So without the point of inspiration and in Batman to represent that a set of principles for him to think about and and enact in his own life he doesn't necessarily have an avenue to exercise grand ideals through like harvey dent does at the beginning of the movie and so he's a lot more practical he has to cut corners like the an ongoing issue in the dark knight is the fact that there are detectives in his um office who are corrupt and Mm -hmm. have been you know bought by the mob and he still works with them Right. And yeah. Dent is, is really annoyed about this constantly. Mm-hmm. And Gordon insists that 
you know, he doesn't really have another choice. It's He's working with the hand that he's been dealt. I think we can talk about a little bit about particulars in terms of how the story reflects these ideas. A big one is the boat scene that we mentioned a number of times. You already said it basically has one boat. It's a social experiment, quite literally. Yes. No joke. This this was, I think, before the whole YouTube social experiment trend. So the Joker did it first. Yeah. The original. Trendsetter. Yeah. Influencer. <laughs> Uh, he does a social experiment with the two boats, one's full of convicts, one's can, full can of families. Can you imagine one of those influencer unboxing videos, but it's just <laughs> Ledger Joker? There's the two two boats, one's full of good people, supposedly, one's full of bad people, supposedly. Um, first one to press the button to blow up the other boat gets to live. If neither do, they both die. And throughout that whole scene, when the Joker is constantly hyping himself up for mm-hmm. the explosions that are going to happen yeah. soon... Batman or Bruce is 100%, he has zero doubt in his mind Mm -hmm. that the people are going to kill each other. Mm -hmm. Or I I don't know if I said that right, but what I mean by that, he he does not believe it's ever going to happen. Yeah, he has no doubt in the fact that the people on the boats will choose not to press the button and kill one another. It isn't necessarily that the he doesn't think that people will consider it. And they, mm-hmm. they do they consider do. it. Yeah. There's a whole debate. There's a whole very well done back and forth on both boats about what's going to happen. But at the end of the day, his belief is that an individual cannot sell their own soul to save their own life, essentially. Because that's the decision that he's making with the Joker, mm-hmm. right? He's refusing to kill the Joker, not because he believes that the Joker as a person is redeemable yes. in any way. Because he doesn't believe that it's good for himself. He would lose himself if he were to kill the Joker. Mm-hmm. If and he were to compromise that, as the Joker wants him to do. Exactly. And he keeps exactly. egging him on throughout the He wants the movie. him to kill him constantly. Yeah. There are many, many scenes where he, he wants him to do it to prove a point. Mm-hmm. And what Batman believes is that a human being who is normal and well-adjusted unlike the joker who Mm -hmm. he's like you're an animal and no one else is like you you're alone Mm -hmm. right you're the only one who thinks like this and uh the people on the boat one of the convicts says something about how you don't know how to take a life or on the other boat they talk about how it doesn't make sense for them to have to for us both to die you know they made their choices in life we should deserve to live. That's yes. what's fair. Yes. Right? They make a very convincing argument for it. Mm-hmm. Um, well, but... the fairness thing of that kind of justice goes yeah. back to dense philosophy. Exactly. Which, but but yeah. at the end of the day, none of those people really know what it means to take a life. They can't do it because they... Well, maybe some of the convicts do. No, no, no That's what the guy says. The yeah. convict tells the guy with the button when he... Spoilers, I guess, at this point. He takes the, the button and throws it out the window so that no one can make the choice. Yes. And the reasoning he gives, kind of vaguely, but I think it's pretty powerful, is that you guys could sit here and talk about this all you want, but at the end of the day, you don't know what it means to have taken a life. And the assumption is that he has taken yes. a life. And, and he, he has knows, had to live with that. And he knows the toll that it takes on an individual, and so he doesn't want anyone to make that choice. Mm-hmm. And on the other boat, the guy who's most willing to press the button, he just can't bring himself to consciously Kill, choose his own yeah, life over, over another, another person in that way. In a way, it's kind of like the trolley problem. Yes. So the famous trolley problem where it's like, do you... Of good place fame. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, many other things. But <laughs> if there's a, a, a train basically going down a track and there are three people on one track and one on the other, do you switch it so that it hits the one or the three, mm-hmm. right? It's supposed to be an impossible decision. And that's mm-hmm. what kind of this part, that that's what the Joker is trying to do here. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, Batman is proven correct. And that's the scene where he kind of beats the Joker mm-hmm. philosophically. And then it's followed by the scene where the Joker wins through corruption of Dent. Corrupting Harvey Dent. So as we said before, Dent isn't principled in the same way that Bruce is. And his sense of justice is tied to fairness and institutions. And once he realizes how corrupt the world is, once he realizes what it feels like to have that corrupt world take things away from you, right? Yeah, and it encroaches upon his own life in a very personal and direct sense. His sense of justice switches to revenge and an eye for an eye. Exactly, an eye for an eye. 
it's very useful to just read off the script for the last scene of the movie with where Dent and Batman have a mm -hmm. very brief, intense conversation because it really highlights the, the fundamental conflict between those two mm -hmm. that we're going to talk about here. So Dent is saying, it's not about what's fair. Sorry, it's not about what I want. It's about what's fair. Mm -hmm. You thought that we could be decent men in an indecent world. You thought that we could lead by example. You thought that the rules could be bent but not broken. You were wrong. The world is cruel. And he has a coin, essentially, that's his idea of balance and fairness. Mm -hmm. The only morality in a cruel world is chance, unbiased, unprejudiced, fair. And then he's threatening to kill Gordon's son yeah. by flipping the coin. And then Batman says, what happened to Rachel wasn't chance. We decided to act. We knew the risks and we acted as one. We're all responsible for the consequences. And Dent says, then why was it only me who lost everything? Mm -hmm. And in this bit, Dent doesn't know that Batman, Batman also lost yes. everything because he had the same relationship with Rachel. Mm hmm and Batman says it wasn't, and Dent gets angry, and he says, the Joker chose me. Mm -hmm. And Batman says, because you were the best of us, he wanted to prove that even someone as good as you could mm -hmm. fall. And Dent says he was right. Batman says, uh, you're fooling yourself if you think letting, you're letting chance decide. You're the one pointing the gun, pointed at the people who were responsible. We all acted as one. So... You can really see the distinction, or the, the contrast here. At any point in the story, no matter what happens, Bruce always believes that he is responsible to himself mm -hmm. to act according to principle mm -hmm. and according to goodness, mm -hmm. regardless of what the consequences of actions were before. Mm -hmm. Dent, at this point, has fully given into this idea that it doesn't matter what he decides. Mm -hmm. Whatever he tries to do... The world, the world is just going to throw him back. Cruel and unfair, exactly. And terrible, and this is a G-rated podcast. So I can't <laughs> swear, but <laughs> all, all of the things that many he of us are thinks, feeling in the day-to-day, -day. and that's yes. what the Joker has tried to do to him is to make him feel powerless in the face of the chaos and anarchy of the world. Mm -hmm. And it's Batman's belief that you can always push back, mm -hmm. uh, whatever has happened, however much you've lost because mm -hmm. of your choices or whatever, whether mm -hmm. it was un in your control or not in your control, life is always going to be uh, punishing. It's going to give you good things. It's going to give you bad things. But you are always responsible for how you move forward, how you react to things. For your own self. Exactly. And that's a principled way of living. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think, sorry, can I pause here? Because sure, this ahead. issue of control is very a very interesting thing in Dan's character, where his idea of justice is entirely tied to his ability to control the events around himself, which is represented through his little flippy coin. Yeah, exactly. Right, where originally the coin is two sides, both heads. And he makes his own luck. He makes his own luck. That's his whole shtick, yeah. right? And then when he, you know, gets in that explosion, one side of the coin is burned and so that is his face, you know, big L. But um, I never actually noticed this until you brought it up. But his suit had also been burned in a way that matched the burn on his skin. But the suit, I think, yeah, that's the fabric what, shouldn't have burned one like that. aesthetic problem with this movie it that looks I have. Good. I can't argue is with that it. the half of his suit that is burned as his face is looks like flesh burns, but it's fabric, man. That's not how fabric burns. Anyway, tangent. I never noticed this until so, you brought it up. Dent's idea of what is just, what is fair, is very much tied to his ability to control his surroundings. Mm -hmm. The minute he personally is not yeah. in control, he freaks out, yeah. right? And I mean, I think that that's something that many of us, you and I included, yeah. struggle with on the daily, where as so long as you feel as though you have some say in what's going on around you, mm -hmm. again, this goes back to Dent's reification of principle right where he thinks that justice is what takes place around you and not justice is rooted in principle in the mm -hmm. abstract right now that is different from organizational equity but that's a different conversation you have control over the principle and the abstract that is mm -hmm. bruce's position yeah. you do not have control no matter how you feel in the moment mm -hmm. 
over the events of the world around you, partially because there are just so many actors at play here, which the Joker demonstrates, and that the systems are corrupt and things like that, that things entirely too complicated to ever even be possible to be in your control are constantly being manipulated and, you know, things are being shifted around and sudden disasters are happening and there's this ripple effect where, especially if, if we step out of the microcosm of Gotham and think about the world that we currently live in, you know, the complexity of the systems that have been erected both on a local, national, and international scale means mean that things that happen in one country are in one city, in some individual person's house, are very much tied to things happening halfway across the world that they have no consciousness of, let alone control over. So I think that's an issue that is very pertinent to Dent's corruption and his meltdown, for lack of a better term, because his completely falsified concept of I make my own luck, which he makes his own luck in a very literal material sense, is totally shattered. The yeah. illusion is goes up in a puff of smoke. Mm. And I think maybe here it's a, it's a good point because hopefully we have a good sense of where all the players stand. Mm -hmm. We can talk about some interesting quotations or references about where these ideas are discussed in the real world outside of the context of the story because I think this is a good place to pause and really think about what the, the story means for ourselves. Well, yeah, I, w I was going to say, I mean, okay, so we know what the movie's philosophy is. We know what Batman believes in, but mm -hmm. is the man right or is the, you know, is... Well, I don't think it's necessarily about what's right. I think everyone can, all the listeners can judge for themselves, but clearly... Does it, does it hold any water? Does Batman's yeah. position that the narrative enforces and yeah. supports hold any water in real life or is he just hopelessly optimistic and idealist? I was it. just going to start with a few quotes that have to do with Stoicism. I think they're helpful to set a more well-defined structure for what Batman's actual ideology mm -hmm. is, particularly with respect to the suffering that he himself endures, mm -hmm. because Rachel is the love of his life. Mm -hmm. She dies just like how Dent is also mm -hmm. in love with her and she dies. And beyond that as the after dent dies and he refuses to return to the light so to speak mm -hmm. there's a further element of sacrifice that batman has to take and this is a continuing theme throughout the movie of him bearing a burden for the sake of others essentially mm -hmm. he's willing to be scorned and be attacked and and killed mm -hmm. or whatever hurt beaten his public image torn down, whatever, 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 and he's willing to bear it for the sake of others. Mm -hmm. And this is a recurring element of his, his character. It's the very end of the movie. It's what the name The Dark Knight means, all yeah, that, that kind of stuff. the really cheesy line that Gordon has. Yeah. He's the Dark Knight. I love how it ends with that as a title card. I actually do really like the reasoning that Batman gives for his sacrifice at the end, mm -hmm. where if you haven't seen the movie, essentially he, he takes blame for Dent's crimes, for for people to still believe that Dent never did anything wrong, mm -hmm. so that his public image is safe. Mm -hmm. He takes responsibility for all the terrible things he does, mm -hmm. and essentially kills off the character of the Batman, mm -hmm. the the superhero character of the Batman in the public's consciousness, mm -hmm. so that he can protect Gotham's soul, so to speak. Uh, he yes. he says particularly that the reason he's doing it is that people deserve to have their faith rewarded. Mm -hmm. So he thinks that the people of Gotham invested in Dent's ability to bring them justice. Mm -hmm. They believed in him and it would shatter them if mm -hmm. they realized what he had done. Yes. And this is also something that he brings up consistently with respect to his friends and family, mm -hmm. right? Of that he believes that people who show faith should, should also get that in return. Mm -hmm. So with respect to all of these things, there's a strong element of stoicism that's a part of his philosophy that I think Nolan puts into the the character. Mm -hmm. A famous philosopher called Seneca said this. He says, For what prevents us from saying that the happy life is to have a mind that is free, lofty, fearless, and steadfast. A mind that is placed beyond the reach of fear, beyond the reach of desire, 
that counts virtue the only good, baseness the only evil. A man thus grounded must, whether he wills or not, necessarily be attended by constant cheerfulness and a joy that is deep and issues from deep within. So this is kind of the point is that it's it comes from deep within. You're not from the externalities, not exactly. from the ends, not from what happens. Exactly. So mm -hmm. in the in the Baha'i faith, it's mentioned that this kind of person, the the ills that all flesh is heir to do not pass him by but they only touch the surface of his life. The depths are calm and serene. Mm -hmm. um, and a very famous... Psychologist, I think? He was also a Holocaust survivor. He was a Holocaust survivor, yes. Yeah. Viktor Frankl, he, he, he brings up this issue many times in his writings. He says, I'll say a few quotes here. Life is never made unbearable by circumstances, but only by lack of meaning and purpose. There was no need to be ashamed of tears, for tears bore witness that a man had the greatest of courage, the courage to suffer. The one thing you can't take away from me is the way I choose to respond to what you do to, to me, what you do to me. The last of one's freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any given circumstance. I think we've made it pretty clear how this connects to Batman's, Batman's position. position. Yeah, and I will say that this is one of those very interesting topics that many superhero stories reflect upon. But what I really like about the the Dark Knight's take on it is that it goes in a more philosophical direction because the characters are more archetypes than they are real people. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I was going to say earlier was this same question of, you know, how do you stand up and fight in a system that's corrupt is one that I... I think we both, we, we just finished watching The Falcon and the Winter Soldier last month. Yeah. And that's a question that that show also deals with. But that deals with it in a far more practical and personal, yeah. individual sense. Mm -hmm. Whereas in, in The Dark Knight, this question of, it, it kind of ties this idea of Viktor Frankl's that the one thing you can't take away from me is the way I choose to respond to what you do to me. It ties it to what justice is, philosophically speaking. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a very powerful thing to think about and something that we, you know, we often have very muddied ideas of what justice actually is, like Harvey Dent does. Mm -hmm. This isn't original to Dark Knight. There, yes. there are many, I mean, many different religions uh, discuss this issue. It's not just philosophies. In both Christianity and Islam, there is a strong emphasis on the choice of the individual mm -hmm. and the precedence that internal strength takes over any kind of physical suffering. Mm -hmm. There is actually, I think this is useful to bring up very briefly. There's a Canadian book by an author that we had to read in our grade 12 English class. Once again, bringing up our grade 12 English teacher's influence. The legend himself. Um, there, it's a book is called Mercy Among the Children. It's a very sad and depressing book. It's interesting. Long story short. Well, it's not, it's not entirely, it's hopeful. I think yes, similar yes. to something like The Dark Knight, it lays out a lot of intense depression and then has a very hopeful ending. Mm -hmm. to, to make it very brief. Uh, there's a character in the story who is a Christian, but he's also believes in Stoic philosophy. He's he's very well read when it comes mm -hmm. to philosophy. He's described as very much loving the book of Job mm -hmm. in the Bible, and he patterns his life after that of Job. So if you want to learn more about that kind of stuff, you could look it up. It's it's very relevant, I think. We in can terms probably of, find a, a summary yeah, video we'll, we'll and put it in the description. Um, about Job. Similarly, you have... Uh, philosophers like Marcus Aurelius, who would always talk about how the major imperative in someone's life is to be true to one's principles, regardless mm -hmm. of reward or punishment. Mm -hmm. I think you you need to have this sense of faith in a world filled with suffering. Mm -hmm. These are all ideas that are repeated throughout history in many different mm -hmm. forms. Faith, but not blind faith in, again, institutions. I think yeah. this, is, this is something that that Batman's relationship with Harvey, as it evolves, Batman realizes that having blind faith in an institution 
that represents certain ideals or in a person that represents an institution is never going to be sustainable because such things mm -hmm. are prone to being corrupted. However, having strong and unshakable and informed conviction in a set of abstract principles, as Batman himself does, is and he so inspires the people around him, like Gordon, and then in the third movie, as messy as that movie is plot-wise, mm -hmm. you know, he inspires the people of Gotham because he represents, you know, a revamped uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll come to version. that. I'll come yeah. to that soon. But, but having conviction, so when you say have faith in, in yeah. something, an ideal, it's a conviction in abstract principle and not blind faith in an institution. Something that I wanted to bring up um, that I, I thought lays this out really well in terms of example in another popular um, story series. A similar concept is discussed in Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix in the book. We don't talk about the movies. So there's this really interesting chapter, because I just reread these books a few months ago to cope, as one does. Uh -huh. And there was a really interesting chapter in Order of the Phoenix where Percy Weasley sends Harry or sends Ron a letter about how he should stop interacting with Harry because the ministry says that he's this total whack job and Dumbledore's this total whack job and da 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 yeah. da da da. da. Mm -hmm. And something that that chapter made me really think about, which you know I see you see in other things as well, but it just laid it out very clearly, was the fact that Percy was not a bad guy, right? But he had placed all of his faith in an institution, i.e. the Ministry of Magic, that represented a set of ideals, right? You know, he had he had placed his faith in the institution and the institution was beholden to the systems around it, to people's fears, to, you know, hierarchies of power, to, um, you know, individual agendas, mm -hmm. to this, this, yeah, that, politics, and the other, politics, corruption, corruption etc. And because his entire conception of the principles that the institution represented was the institution once the institution had been corrupted he could not take a step back and understand what had happened he was mm -hmm. kind of almost doomed to get caught up either he had to completely divorce himself from the institution and deal with that intense cognitive dissonance or he had to go along with the institution and go further into the other cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. of well this represents something good even though everything i see of it is bad and it's going against everything i know about my family and the people who care mm -hmm. about me and the things that you know i've been taught to represent so i guess long story short here is that when one places all of their faith in something that represents principles as opposed to having a strong understanding of the abstract philosophical nature mm. of the principles themselves, one is almost inevitably going to be let down at best or trapped at worst when that representation is corrupted by the mm. relative chaos of the world. Well, Batman in this story combines that with a very strong active belief and intervention and and social action and mm -hmm. interaction with society. Yes. He doesn't take a passive approach. No. He's he's very much personally stoic and principled, but he doesn't he doesn't see that as meaning that he, he shouldn't interact with society. Because society isn't also super stoic and principled. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And this is a, a big part of I think you brought up this quote actually when we were talking about this before. Do you want to say that? Oh, yeah, the the Tolstoy quote. So Leo Tolstoy, very famous Russian writer and philosopher. If anybody knows War and Peace, this is the guy who wrote it. Sidebar. I saw the other day somebody refer to War and Peace as WAP abbreviated, like Oof. the, the Cardi B <laughs> song. And I just had a moment where I had to pause and reflect on where we've arrived as a world. But so anyway, Tolstoy says, quote, Everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. I mean, that's a bit of a gimmicky quote, but... I mean, Michael Jackson said that in, in Man in the Mirror. Man in the Mirror, <laughs> right, you know? <laughs> With Batman, 
first and foremost is the individual, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that he, he doesn't follow up with mm -hmm. the world. It's not a dichotomy. Exactly. With respect to that, I think it's useful to maybe tie everything together mm -hmm. with the full trilogy because... Yes. God, are we going to go over an hour again? No, it's fine. Uh, no, don't worry. It's okay. We've got time. <laughs> uh, I think it's very useful to go over the full arc that Bruce himself goes mm -hmm. through for a, for kind of a, a personal understanding of mm -hmm. how the story relates to one's own choices. Mm -hmm. uh, the Dark Knight brings a very good contrast between the Joker's position, Batman's position, Dent's position, and how they all intersect. Mm -hmm. But it's not complete. Mm -hmm. It asks a lot of questions, and I think it does a very good job. Yes. But it doesn't fully really resolve Bruce's arc. Mm -hmm. But I do think that the full trilogy does that. And I'm going to go over how I think it does that, even though it's not super explicit. Mm -hmm. So I'll kind of start from the beginning. And if you haven't seen the trilogy, this is all you really need to know. <laughs> this is the ultimate summary a la me. So we're going to start with Batman mm -hmm. Begins. Bruce, his parents are killed when he's a kid. When he grows up, he's faced with his parents' mm -hmm. killer. And his first instinct is to want revenge, mm -hmm. right? He wants to kill him in return, eye for an eye. He meets the League of Shadows. He goes on this journey of self-discovery mm -hmm. to kind of direct his anger or whatever. And they teach him that revenge is silly. Individual revenge is pointless. You have to reform society. You have to fix things, mm -hmm. impose strict and ruthless justice into society. We are the arbiters of who's worthy and who, who should die mm -hmm. based on their crimes. As long as there are power structures in place that can control people, we're good. Very totalitarian. Right. Yeah, exactly. So the, sh the League imposes their will through physical power and they, they use this, this kind of symbol of fear of retribution on mm -hmm. evildoers. Yeah, um, thanks Liam Neeson. And of course their will is kind of arbitrary because they're an institution yeah. and they are beholden to corruption and they are very corrupt. Yes. Which is why Bruce rejects it and instead he chooses to operate individually mm -hmm. as a symbol of fear well, kind of the same thing fear and retribution yeah he doesn't yeah. change that element yeah he just chooses to move away from the institution yes he chooses to operate as i a... can do this on my own <laughs> yeah <laughs> he, he chooses to operate well but in the one thing he changes is that he doesn't kill anyone yes so the point the point is he wants to act as a deterrent yes. you know if he spooks people He's not going to be judge, jury, and executioner, mm -hmm. but he's so spooky that all the criminals are never going to show up again. No one does crime because he's the boogeyman. Yes, right? basically. That, that's kind of his intention. And he's very successful of, in that moving into the Dark Knight in the second movie. But very swiftly realizes that it's not sustainable because that kind of symbol incites the... It inspires the wrong kind of action and also incites intense challenge exactly. in the form of so, the Joker. So at the beginning of The Dark Knight, criminals are running scared and that element of it is working, but his symbolism hasn't quite worked out the way he wanted because society is still corrupt and it's still kind of just adapting around his mm -hmm. new presence in the system. And the people who he wanted to inspire are inspired in kind of the wrong way. They see him as kind of an example of how great it is to fight back and be violent. And then we have the Joker who shows up, like you said, as a very direct challenge. Um, and we went through all of this. Batman's symbol is failing. And so in the story, this is the part that we, maybe we haven't talked about as much in terms of Bruce's personal motivations. Mm -hmm. uh, Bruce needs to find a solution to this issue of symbolism. And he chooses Dent. Mm -hmm. He sees Dent as being the best of us. He sees him as a symbol of institutional reform mm -hmm. he he gives a face to justice he isn't hiding mm -hmm. behind a mask he he says that multiple times gotham needs a hero with a face yes and so but then he realizes that dent is not a sustainable solution either because dent is a beholden to the system and b operating according to this arbitrary sense of justice and not according to principle. Yeah, Dent is a person. And his, mm -hmm. his the, the choice he makes at the end of the movie is noble in intention, but ultimately it's the wrong choice. Because what he does... The choice Bruce makes, yes, not Dent. Yes, the choice that Bruce makes. What <laughs> the he, choice Dent makes is not noble in yeah. intention. <laughs> Dent fails. And yes. Bruce is like, it's fine. We just pretend like he didn't fail, right? He, he, he kind of 
just decides that, well, the symbol of Dent is still good enough. Mm -hmm. The symbol of institutional reform is still good enough. Yes. Right. And and if people can get behind that, we're all fine. Yes. And largely that's motivated by his own desire to run away from the world yes. because he is depressed. He yes. is absolutely drowning in grief and, and self-hatred. Self yeah. And his choice at the end, although it he means well, isn't really made for the right reasons. He, he basically exiles himself in yes. shame. And then again, the the symbol that he left Gotham with is once again not sustainable. Exactly. So, and the reason is that Dent's symbol was a facade, and eventually, it the lie is undone. Yes. And it has a terrible consequence in yes. the third one. Now, the third movie is not as consistent with the storylines, and I think largely that might have to do with the fact that. Uh, he Ledger passed away. Exactly. So yeah. I'm very sure that he was supposed to come back in a much more major role because he doesn't die. Yeah, the Joker doesn't the Joker die. Doesn't I die. always forget that the Joker doesn't exactly, die at the end exactly. of Batman. Yeah. I think he was supposed to come back to a pretty major role. He doesn't. They had to redo a lot of the scripts, I'm pretty sure. Yes. I don't know exactly what happened, but, but the point is, is that... It's all around. I think they did a pretty good job with still getting through the major part that I'm going to mm -hmm. talk about here. And and what that has to do with is the fact that Bruce can't just rely on this lie that the system is just, mm -hmm. right? He needs to actually save the people of Gotham directly as opposed to just on being On an like, individual level. On a... Well, he can't, he can't just say, the system is fine. G guys, go to the system. Yes. I'm, I'm going to peace out. You yes. guys could, should deal with the system. Ultimately, the League of Shadows returns to destroy Gotham because it's corrupt. Yeah. Gotham's Reckoning. Yeah. <laughs> and they wipe it out. And once again, you see this issue of redemption where the League of Shadows sees absolutely no redeemable qualities in the people of Gotham. They're yeah. just like, wipe it off this the face of the theme. planet, start over. And and Bruce refuses. He believes that people are never beyond saving. Yes. Um, and so ultimately his character arc is completed in this movie when he realizes that, and this is what the whole rising out of the shadows is yes. for, for the, the storyline, he realizes that he has to take ownership of his responsibility to society. Yes. Um, it's no longer just individual revenge. It's not this kind of totalitarian thing that the, the League of Shadows is doing. It's not a symbol of fear. It's not a symbol of fear, but rather a symbol of hope. He has to openly declare what he stands for, regardless of how terrible you know the system is yes. or how terrible people are. Even if it means personal sacrifice. Exactly. Whatever happens to you, you as an individual have capacity and you have the responsibility to stand against that. To and, stand against... You know, the, the system that's apathetic and there's a status quo and it's uncompassionate and it's resigned to the fate of the world, you know? Yes. This is just the way things are. So you stand for your principles regardless, it completely detached from the consequences of that stance in your own life, yeah. as Bruce does in The Dark Knight mm -hmm. Rises. But no, it's it's quite literal. His his transformation from the Dark Knight into this the third movie, like in 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 the Dark Knight and Batman Begins, for the most part, he operates completely alone. He operates in shadows and darkness, and he's mostly just beating up criminals. Mm -hmm. And the third one, he's operating with a team and friends mm -hmm. consistently throughout the movie. He's running in, around in broad daylight he's running around in broad daylight fighting alongside other people citizens of yeah, gotham. regular people in you know gotham. He, stuff that never really happens in the previous movies like he saves a bus full of children oh yeah he's, classic he's no longer really the boogeyman he's he's more of a calling card for hope and humanity yes well he's more of a superhero in the traditional sense exactly so he he actually literally in the movie inspires ordinary people to fight back against against the invasion of Bane or whatever. Yeah, uh, well, it, the, it's this, a very literal metaphor. It's but the it's, idea it's still... of step up and overcome the lower nature that all the Batman villains seem intent on, you know, believing in. Exactly, right. Exactly. Yeah. That and Batman, of course, always insists that you know, no people are better than this. They can step up. You know, have the courage. Mm -hmm. Have the the love for one another, have compassion, you know, exercise justice. And in The Dark Knight Rises, he motivates people to do that through him representing those things very directly, exactly. as opposed to his negative approach in the previous movies where he demotivates people from not doing that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so uh, at the end of the day, he dies, quote unquote. I mean, 
the movie doesn't end with him dying because that would be terribly depressing but yeah. symbolically the point is in the eyes of the people of gotham he dies in a big sacrifice yes. to save all of their lives yes right and he's as, as opposed to punishing evildoers his final act is self-sacrifice mm -hmm. to save people you know for the purpose of a higher ideal exactly a higher belief um and he's principle. memorialized in a statue where his identity is still unknown mm -hmm. no one ever knows that it's it's bruce, it's wayne. bruce wayne and the whole point of that is that he's a reminder that batman could have been any of them yeah it could have been any person right the person next to you could have been willing to give their life for yours mm -hmm. without you ever knowing it or mm -hmm, being able mm -hmm. to thank them right anyone can make that ultimate ultimate sacrifice and people can hate them for it, like mm -hmm. people hated Batman. Mm -hmm. But well, they do it without recognition or glory. And that's kind of the completion of Batman's symbol. I thought it was relevant to bring up that his story isn't complete in the movie. The question that's brought up in The Dark Knight about how someone fights against chaos and injustice mm -hmm. in the world is raised very well in the mm -hmm. second movie. And the dynamic between Dent's failure versus Batman's strength of resolve in his principles is key mm -hmm. but he still succumbs very much so to the terrible things that happen to him right and he doesn't mm -hmm. bounce back until the third movie when he finally completes his arc mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think that i mean as the movies raise a lot of questions we've also raised a lot of questions here and have not necessarily given solid answers or connectors to our own lives i think as i said the two things that these movies bring to mind is philosophically what does justice look like in relation to one's personal principled position because that's very different from the traditional criminal justice system concept or mm -hmm. fairness of daily life concept of justice that people often colloquially talk about and the other question or the other idea that this brings up is this issue that, you know, we brought up quotes from Tolstoy, from Stoicism, and I also really like this one from Thomas Akempis, who was a German-Dutch monk way back in the 1300s, where he says, A good and devout man arranges in his mind the things he has to do, not according to the whims of evil inclination, but according to the dictates of right reason. Who is forced to struggle more than he who tries to master himself? This ought to be our purpose then, to conquer self, to become stronger each day, to advance in virtue. And I think this idea of not according to the whims of evil inclination, in the Dark Knight story, evil inclination can be, you know, the Joker manipulating everyone and trying to mm -hmm. goad Batman into breaking his principle. It can be the corruption of the system that suddenly encroaches into Harvey Dent's life. It can be the loss of of something that was dear to you. Mm -hmm. something. I mean, if I can jump in, yes, I don't. I don't mean to take over here, but I think what you're saying is is a good issue of Batman's loss of Rachel because yes. his choice once again at the end of the, of the second one is like the shadow of Rachel's death is really hanging over him. And, and it informs his personal choices. He was very choices. selfish. Yeah, he, 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 he's very selfish with relationship with when in his relationship with Rachel yeah. in that movie because he sees her almost as a physical reward for the suffering that he's enduring yes. as Batman. And I think it's very well contrasted mm -hmm. in the third one where in the second one, he's constantly kind of hoping for Rachel as his own one chance at a normal life yes. after everything is over he's yeah. trying to get dent to take his place as mm -hmm. the savior of gotham so that he can go off and live yes. happily ever after uh whereas in the third movie selena kyle who isn't a perfect character but i yes. think she reflects Bruce's transformation in a very good way where she herself is very self-serving she's not an evil person no not but at all. she's kind of jaded by how terrible the world is and so she protects herself and her own interests and and by own i mean like her own clan so yeah her squad her, her squad, yeah. what's her name uh juno temple <laughs> yeah like her friends yeah, essentially. yeah um and she kind of is constantly tempting him in that movie to leave Right, yeah, to, not to not in a seductress sense, but in a philosophical sense. Yeah, to, 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 yeah. I mean, she kind of does both. 
<laughs> it's Catwoman, come on. So she, she's constantly getting him to leave behind Gotham, right? That's what she's trying to convince him of in that movie. As yes. opposed to it before, Bruce is constantly trying to convince Rachel to let him leave. Yes. Right? In this one... Bruce is the one who is inspiring Selena to yeah, realize exactly. that, hmm, maybe I should stop, take stock of, you know... Mm -hmm what my position is, who I am, what I can contribute to this situation. You know, this idea of arranges in his mind the things he has to do, not according to the whims of whatever is going yeah. on around him, but according to the dictates of right reason. Yeah, so that, that selfishness is, I think, another part of that evil inclination. Mm -hmm. Because she gives him the option of leaving. She's like, you don't mm -hmm. owe these people anything. Mm -hmm. Just come with me. You'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And instead, he stands his ground and convinces her to help instead yes. of the other way around and I, I think that's a great continuation of the story mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. i think the quote that you brought up is is very useful for this like there are all kinds of different forces that are acting upon the mm -hmm. characters in the story and in many different ways someone can succumb to mm -hmm. the kind of chaos and hopelessness that the world mm -hmm. exists in finally to go back to the question of the, like what concept of justice does the premise and the philosophy of the narrative in the dark knight represent bruce's position as we talked about is that he always has the choice to believe in the capacity of others even if they do not exhibit that capacity his dialogue with harvey dent in the final scene where he tells harvey that there still and always is an individual choice demonstrates this and for me this is a really interesting reflection on true justice and ties into one of my favorite passages from the Baha'i scriptures that says, quote, the essence of all that we have revealed for thee is justice, is for man to free himself from idle fancy and imitation, discern with the eye of oneness the world around him, and look into all things with a searching eye. Now, I'd argue that looking at creation or the world around you with an eye of oneness could be interpreted that all human beings are created equal and one in a profound and you know metaphysical sense beyond their physical social and environmental distinctions hierarchies you know whether someone's a criminal a banker a you know single mom or whatever right mm -hmm. this country that country this race that race gender yeah. sexuality all of these different things so looking at creation with an eye of oneness is a direct correlate with having conviction in the potential and equitable capacity for good and nobility in all human beings that yeah. Bruce holds so strongly in mm -hmm. the second movie in particular. Yeah, and, I mean, the... you know, he doesn't cede to the ideas and opinions of others as we spoke about, but he's also always willing to learn and grow and, as we said, eventually accept his own mistakes. And he has that conviction in the higher nature of everyone. And I think going back to this passage, that conviction, that looking through that lens is Bruce's concept of justice. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting and very uncompromisable concept of justice because it's purely theoretical and ironically completely in your control. Yeah, It is something that you can have total agency over in your life mm -hmm. which is a far cry from the chaotic mob mentality justice that we often encounter nowadays uh where in the real world in the yeah. real world you know someone or some institution or some group of people or some whatever has done something wrong and we must then therefore go out of our way to deep, enact deep justice them down, yeah. on them onto them right in a again punitive sense as opposed to what bruce ends up doing which is representing an ideal for others to follow mm -hmm. moving forward and i think this is a conversation that the, like the real world social action thing is a conversation we can have when we do the falcon and the winter soldier episode because yeah this, i think this, sam this is, a, is a much better uh, uh representation of like immediate action how you do it in your own life i think at the end of the day but yeah this is a great point that you're bringing up i think at the end of the day whether or not one's principles or one's belief in humanity comes from religious origins or from 
more philosophical kind of humanist origins is Mm -hmm. really a big conversation for another time. Yeah. Uh, But what's really important, I think, here is the answer to that question that I think the story provides, and I think provides a good argument for how I see it, about how you contend with chaos and injustice, is that you are always that unshakable constant. And the reason you can be an unshakable Mm -hmm. constant isn't because of your physical capacity to do good or to fix things or to help others or mm-hmm. to even punish others. Yeah. But because of the the point or principle that you can represent, the effect that that has on other people mm-hmm. is worth more than you can ever know individually. Mm-hmm. And which, I, that's which something ties that ties back to our previous episode. That's something that, that yeah, Batman that we... himself struggles with a lot, right? And that that's why he needs Alfred's pep talks yeah. because he doesn't feel like he's being successful a lot mm-hmm. of times. He feels like his his message is going unheeded or it's not being mm-hmm. understood. Right. And I think that's something that everyone personally struggles yeah. with. It's not easy to represent an ideal in your own life because it's often it, there's no feedback. Yeah. There's no real. You feel like you're yelling into a void and the void becomes bigger every day with exactly. the way that you the circumstances that we're currently in. Yeah. You feel like people hate you for it or they just don't care or they don't understand. Yeah. And All with, of that. with social media, there's this panopticon <laughs> of, like, somebody out there is hating me for wanting to love others. Yeah. <laughs> so at the end of the day, the real the reason that I've always enjoyed this movie in particular, it's not at all dark. Yeah, it's, it's it, very hopeful, fundamentally. Fundamentally, what Batman represents in the story is something that I can connect with very deeply as Mm -hmm. an individual in the world Mm -hmm. regardless of whether you lived 2000 years ago or now yeah circumstances change but i think the message is is very well constructed yes and i think it's a lot of these questions are really worth marinating in your mind and just kind of letting it sit and think because it's not something you can figure out the the movie doesn't give you directives and i think we've, we've talked about this in our first episode how our intention isn't really to say Okay, so I guess do this because yeah. stories aren't really like that. I mean, we're not a rich person with a ton of gadgets able to go fight the mob yeah. in our world. That, that, that doesn't really make sense, right? But but what you can take away is the meaning behind it in the metaphor. The metaphor, yeah. So Alfred has a great quote in the scene of hopelessness for Batman. Endure. Take it. People will hate you for it, but that's the point. You can be an outcast. You can make the choice that no one else can face. You can make the right choice. I think this maybe connects to the issue of eucatastrophe that we talked about in the very first mm-hmm, episode to mm-hmm. maybe tie things back is there there does need to be a belief that there is a light at the end of the tunnel there has to yes. be a belief that when you are enduring it you're not enduring it for the sake of self-loathing or for the sake of like pushing all the blame onto yourself or feeling like you're in charge of all the bad things that are happening well in the you're world. also not enduring it in total inaction i think the endurance goes hand in hand with representing particular stance and principle and holding yourself in account as Mm -hmm. we spoke about which i think again as you said ties back to the eucatastrophe episode and tolkien's thesis on how everyone through their actions and through their their moral positions and the attributes they represent can are you thinking of the everyone (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah he was the everyone okay but you know through the through their Apologies. actions it's the, very late their attributes they can reflect things that tie directly into the logic of the world around them the higher meta narrative exactly and in this case when alfred goes and you at master wayne that was a terrible that impression. wasn't bad actually it was um, better than mine the idea is that you're not enduring passively yeah. you're not just you know sitting there in your mansion with your feet up on the yeah. table well, I mean, yeah, we talked Whatever. about the, the suffering that the characters go through in Lord of the Rings, right? Yes. It's the same thing. You're enduring something for the sake of a higher truth or a higher narrative. Exactly. In this case, that higher truth is Bruce's belief yes. in uh, that justice and that unshakable sense of... And you're not of... compromising yourself according to the whims of evil inclination. Exactly. Even if that means that you are struggling in the moment and other people mm-hmm. are also struggling. Like... Yeah, great stuff. I mean, all around, round of applause for everyone involved with Chris Nolan's Batman good stuff. Batman movies, yeah. They all did a great job, I think. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, I miss Heath Ledger. All right. So thanks for listening, you guys. Um, as always, please feel free to comment below with any suggestions, thoughts, questions, ideas. Things got across clearly. You kind of understood what we were talking about or you want to add in your own thoughts. Or you want to recommend something else to go watch. I'm sure there are a lot of great YouTube videos or articles out there about the Dark Knight trilogy because yes. it's been around for so long. So currently we're, this is, YouTube is the only platform that we're using, but we are thinking of expanding to, what was it called, Anchor? It would be on Spotify, right? It would be on Spotify eventually. So once we figure that out, we will also be going in that direction, the platform that you can listen yeah. to it on, because I know YouTube can be kind of a pain in the also, butt. Also, because we're in early stages right now, it would be very much appreciated to leave comments even if you have no thoughts whatsoever, no thoughts, head empty, is that what you always say? No thoughts, head empty. <laughs> just say a comment saying, what's up, whatever you want, just so that we can get a sense of people are out there, people are listening, you know, they, they care. Even if you just listen to the end, if you got this far and you didn't turn it off, that is good God enough. bless you, man. Yeah. <laughs> That's good enough for us. Just let us know. All right. See you next time, guys. Bye.